Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Love you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We know you, Jesus. We glorify Jesus. 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 Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Hallelujah. 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 Sit down. Brothers and as you know that last Sunday we celebrated the feast of the Corpus Christi, one of the most important feasts in the Catholic Church calendar. It is one of the most important feasts because all our faith rests on this feast. Because the feast of the Corpus Christi, which is a Latin word which means the body of Christ. And since the body contains also blood, so it means the body is not without blood. So it means the feast of the body and blood of Christ, which was shared on the cross for miserable sinners like you and me, through which opened up the gates of heaven for all mankind, a sacrifice for the salvation of the whole world, including the pagan and the Gentile nations, thus allowing the conversion of you and me, like we were pagans or Gentiles, and afterwards the disciples of Jesus came and we were converted to Christianity. So, princess, in the celebration of this feast of Corpus Christi, we confirm the real presence of the body and the blood of Christ and we do this in remembrance of Christ when Christ tells us, do this in remembrance of me. So, whenever we eat the bread and drink the wine in the form of Holy Communion during Mass, we remember the, what Christ told us to do this in remembrance of me. Now, this feast of Corpus Christi was inspired by the religious experience of Someone called Saint Juliana of Cornelian, Belgium. Nowadays you must not have heard and there are not many saints from Belgium. So this is one of the earliest saints and after that I think there are hardly any saints from Belgium. Now who in a vision saw Mama Mary and she showed her the church being under a full moon which she said was the church's calendar and she showed a black spot on the calendar and that black spot she said was that the church was not celebrating one of the most important feasts and that was the body and blood in other words the holy eucharist the feast of the holy eucharist saint juliana goes and shares this story with uh, tells this to the local bishop who in 1246 issued a decree for such a feast to be celebrated in his territory so throughout belgium the festival then was instituted throughout the church by pope Urban IV in 1264. Before that, there was no universal feast to celebrate the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. The feast was instituted by him by decreeing a papal bull called Transiturus de Hoc Mundo, and he named three purposes for instituting this feast. Number one, to honor Jesus Christ our Lord. Number two, for asking forgiveness from Jesus for what was done to him. And number three, protesting against those who denied the presence of God in the sacred host. Many people, you might be knowing that, uh, you know, they say, they deny that the existence of Jesus, especially in the Western countries. If you go to America, for example, there are a lot of people who do not believe that, uh, that the host, the communion, is the real body and blood of Christ. Especially in America, there is a big debate going on. And in a lot of Western countries, there's a big debate going on. Now, of course, it has also got to do maybe with the lifestyle of the religious leaders like priests and nuns. And uh, looking at that, they say that uh, there are a lot of cases of abuse and all that. Being unlike here in Goa, India, where we try to, where we are taught in catechism, you know, that uh, priest is holy and you should not say anything about him. And people normally do not bring out anything about that. There they are taught that you should go and talk about what happened with you. So there it is all going on and our church right now is in a complete mess, so as to say. So a lot of the people, now this was that time, this heresy was going on where, where the body and blood, uh, blood of Christ was denied that uh, the communion did not contain the body and blood of Christ. But now, in most of the Western countries, it is still denied that the host contains the body and blood of Christ. Brothers and now this feast Corpus Christi was made an obligatory feast for all Roman Catholics by Pope Clement V in 1311 at the Council of Vienna. In 1551, the Council of Trent described the feast as a triumph over heresy 
What they meant by this is what that when Christians celebrated the feast, they affirmed the belief of the doctrine of, that was of uh, transubstantiation, where the host, where the piece of wafer becomes turns into the body and blood of Christ. As I told you, that there were a lot of heresies going on that time especially by the protestants and uh, the main person who started up uh, protestant reforms was martin king luther uh, ex uh, friar friar monk or priest as you call it he belonged to the augustine uh, friars and they had to you know go and beg for their food every day they were not given like now in this church where you go and give the priest nice uh, rich food or you give them money and things like that or there is collection trade unlike that during that time in those years in those centuries the priests or the friars or the monks as they were called they had to go and beg for their own food they had to go in the snow in minus degrees temperatures or in the hot summers and wear their cape and all that and beg people for food or for money and only that and that was shared by all in the if supposing there were five of them and only one person managed to get a little bit all five had to share whatever one got so it was a very difficult time and in fact many people say that one of the reasons why Martin Luther King also became a heretic or a protestant was because of this difficult life because he could not cope up with this difficult life of course there are other reasons as uh, as the reason of indulgences which was going on during the church that time wherein a rich person could buy indulgences and you know and could say he would buy his ticket to heaven he would say like okay all your sins are forgiven if you give a certain amount to the church that also was a, another reason why Martin Luther became a protestant and started this reformist thing so but just coming back to the topic of Corpus Christi St. Ignatius of Antioch, one of the early church fathers who was a disciple and co-worker of St. John the Apostle. He was the third uh, bishop of the city of Antioch in around the year 110 AD, 110 after the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote seven letters to various churches when he was on his way to Rome to be martyred. In one of the letters, Ignatius describes those who reject the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist as heretics. Brothers and you see that when the, all this prayers which are said during the recital, during the mass and all the prayers which are there in the missal, in the holy books of the church they were found in such a way by they were found by people who were very close to the disciples of Jesus and uh, they were taken from all the prayers and all the teachings of Jesus which were given to the disciples and then passed on to these people who were very close to the disciples of Jesus so all these prayers contained a lot of power in them so when they were said by holy people, when they were recited by holy people who were dedicated to holiness like monks and friars, it had to happen, the miracles had to happen, like the transubstantiation had to happen and there was no question about transubstantiation not, uh, not happening at all. So Francis, most of the early church fathers, they, they were, and most of the early saints, they would stress on this, um, the host turning into the body and blood of Christ was real and not something made up. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 24, in the last chapter we find that on the road to Emmaus, the disciples fail to recognize Jesus as he goes on talking with them. They cannot, cannot recognize Jesus. But it is only after they insist with Jesus to come and stay with him overnight. And when Jesus breaks the bread, breaks the bread, only then do they recognize that it is the Lord Jesus. Brothers, all the Gospels, all the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, tell us how Jesus fed thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fish. After satisfying the hunger of the people, there were plenty to spare. The Holy Bible shows us many examples of God feeding His people. The breaking of bread was a very important ritual, conducted with a lot of reverence and significance by the early Christians because it uh, resonated and it again showed in a way that God was feeding his people and God continues to feed his people and God's intention was always to feed his people if you see today's gospel we see that Jesus is so dismayed and feels so bad and sorry for the people when he sees how the people are suffering 
and so he appoints his twelve disciples and tells them and go and do all the wonders and miracles in my name perform uh, make the dead alive uh, heal the sick feed the poor he gives them all kinds of powers when he sees them so brothers and sisters our God is a loving God our God is a God of providence so he continues to give us his bread his food he, which he started giving right from the time uh, in the desert to the Israelites, to the Jews in the form of manna and later on we find that uh, there was always a bear, bread kept in the holy sanctuary as a bread of presence as a bread of presence and after that Jesus comes and gives his own flesh, body and blood for us and before that he feeds the people, the poor and he finds that there are so many people as his holy people they require to eat his flesh and blood and people will always be hungry unless they eat his body and blood it is like some people have this uh, unsatiating hunger right no matter how much you eat it's a disease you cannot be satisfied so that is why Jesus said none of the things of this world can satisfy us none of this food of this world can satisfy us however expensive or however tasty or whatever it might be but only is only the bread which contains the body and blood of our Lord Jesus which can satisfy us brothers and sisters as all of this we are told in the gospel of Mark chapter 14 verses 20 to 24 while they were eating he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it he broke it gave it to them and said take this is my body then he took a cup and after giving thanks he gave it to them and all of them drank from it he said to them this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many praise the lord, praise the lord. Hallelujah. hallelujah he said this is the blood which is poured out for many so Francis, his body and blood is one thing that allowed a lot of people, especially the Gentiles and the pagans to come into the kingdom of God, to enter into the kingdom of God. Now St. Paul who was chosen by Jesus after his death and resurrection as an apostle to the Gentiles lays a lot of stress and importance to the Eucharist, to the Gentile converts as he proclaims to the people of Corinth the things that he had learned and received from our Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks he <coughs> broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Brothers and sisters, I told you, the early protestants like Martin Luther and the people after him, the protestants they did not believe it they, they called it a heresy that that uh, piece of wafer would turn into the body and blood of Christ, they would not believe it but later on little by little as, uh, the, as uh, the different denominations started coming together as the church started having dialogue with the other denominations they came to realize the importance of breaking of bread, breaking of the bread as in the body and blood of Christ. So now if you see most of the Christian denomination, most of the Protestant denominations and whatever denominations there are, they all have in their service in whichever way possible breaking of the bread. All of them have breaking of the bread. Like we have a wafer, we have the wafer, they have a, they literally have bread, this is a bread, they break it their yeah, pastor will break it and then pass it on to the congregation because if you see the gospel if you see the bible especially the new testament it's all about Jesus giving his body and blood so it is now after many years after many centuries that they have realized that breaking 
of the bread and, and uh, distributing the body and blood of Christ is a very important is a very important ceremony and a very important part of worship. Now, brothers, and sisters, after impressing upon, after Saint Paul impressing upon the people, especially the Gentiles, the importance of partaking, the eating in the body of Christ and drinking His blood, he gives them a warning, and basically a warning to not only Gentiles and uh, pagans, but all of us, the believers, the chosen ones, the Christians, the Catholics, in one Corinthians chapter eleven. Verses 27 to 30. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what I saw as St. Paul says, he says, we bring judgment upon ourselves. When we eat and drink of the blood of Christ, without discerning or with sin in our body, we bring judgment upon ourselves. He says, many of, our, many of you are weak and ill and some have died. So brothers and sisters, many of us take this going for Eucharist celebration as a joke, going for communion as a joke. Sometimes you go for somebody's funeral and you are there in the middle and everybody is going for communion, you also go for communion. You are not even ready. Sometimes you go for mass in the middle of the mass and you go for communion, everybody is going, you are going. Sometimes you have so many sins, you have not yet confessed, you go for communion. Communion is the body and blood of Christ, but you have no reverence for it. You, you don't realize what it is you are doing. And that is why St. Paul says, many are sick, weak and ill, and many die. And instead of giving you any blessings, it will bring a curse upon you. That's what it wants you. And that is what is happening to many of us. Brothers and sisters, some years back, before our anointing, I should go for mass sometimes on Wednesdays and Fridays, 6.15 mass and I would see one uh, couple and especially the men would be there, the wife would not be there and we were staying in a flat down that side and then down that road there was a gadi, you know, a witch and then many times in the evenings when I should go to buy bread from the bakery I would see them going to this uh, gadi, that witch over there on that road going down there and every day yet whenever I should go for mass they were there for mass so this is the problem with our people. I don't know what 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 do they think they are, they are doing? Going for mass every day, going taking the body and blood and blood body and blood of Christ. Then they go to the witches also. Then they go to the false gods also. There was yet another man whom I saw every morning. He would come for mass first mass. He would be in the first place. He would be the first person to take the communion. He would sit in such a place way that he would be the first person to take the communion and I would always think that this man is very holy and he will always be in heaven and I had a high regard for him in my mind until one day I went to this Gandhi market and I saw that he was, a, he was wearing his uniform and his name and tag everything was there and he was a market inspector and I saw him, you know what he was doing, he was going to all these vendors, these uh, vegetable sellers, fruit, uh, fruit sellers beef uh, sellers, whatever, all those shops in the Gandhi market and demanding from them for free whatever he wanted or threatening them and they were all handing to them and on his, on his chest was his name. Imagine what kind of a name he is giving to others and yet every day in the morning he would go for mass and first thing he would be and first person to take the communion. I don't know what must have happened to him, but suddenly my image of him changed in my mind. And then I realized people are not what they are. This world, brothers and sisters, is full of plasticity and duplicity. Nobody is what they seem. Each and every one of us, like uh, you might know, who was that? William Shakespeare, right? Who said, this whole world is a stage. This whole world is a stage and everyone is an actor. And many of us nowadays don't even 
um, bother to wear costumes and props. If you go to a drama or a theatre, you know they have to wear costumes and props, right? Now we don't even wear costumes. The costume is in our skin. We are so hardcore. Everyone has become, everyone has become an actor. Nobody is what they seem. It is only later on that you find what people are. And in psychology, like as I was, I don't like to read the psychology, but I was reading a little bit of it. And psychology says that, uh, and it was also quoted by our Christian saints, our Catholic saints like Saint Teresa of Avila, that nothing remains the same. Everything changes. Nothing remains the same. So it has good, it has a good connotation, it has a bad connotation. Maybe if you are in a good place, you want it to remain. If you are in a bad place, you are in a bad thing, remember that it will not remain. The same thing will not remain. After some years it will pass. That is one thing, nothing remains the same. And the second thing is, people also do not remain the same. So you cannot trust. Today someone who is nice to you, many people especially in the family make decisions. In the family days, you know, like my father, my mother, my brother, my sister and my brother and we'll stay together, we'll get married and we'll stay together but it doesn't look like that. Tomorrow his, your brother gets married and it changes. Because that's how it is. And then you start, you start cursing everything and then you say, how did this happen? My brother was so nice. Because nothing stays the same and nobody stays the same. And that is one thing we have to remember. Everything changes and everyone changes, except God. So many people put faith in, so many people put faith in people. Maybe for you they are religious people, they are holy people. But you don't know what they do in private. Maybe you call them people of God. In fact, some people, some people give so much importance and lay so much of stress on the holiness of the certain person that even if Jesus was to come and stand next to him, and if Jesus was to say, you are a sinner, you would say, hey, you, you get out from there. This person is a saint. So such is the such, such way our world is in and many of us live in such a way and yet then we cry later on. Remember these two things that nothing stays the same and no one stays the same. People change. Today they are yours, tomorrow they are somebody else's. That is how life is. But we all belong to God. So we have to be uh, rooted in God. We have to be rooted in Christ and in the Blessed Virgin Mary. And one, and one very important thing I'll tell you why you have to be rooted to the Blessed Virgin Mary is because even if you sin and go to Jesus, right? And go to God the Father. I mean, God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Trinity, the one and then they take time, maybe you'll take time to forgive. But if you go to the Blessed Virgin Mary, she immediately forgives you. And she not only does that, but she also takes you, takes up your case up with the Holy Trinity, with the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. She takes your case up and makes them. And Jesus and the and the Father and the Holy Spirit, they don't they don't deny her what you say. So it is very important to be in very close, in a very close relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary because she immediately takes up your case. She forgives immediately, her heart is like what it is to be, be to be a human. Because she was the mother of God. She is the one who led Christ to the 30 years before he began his ministry. She is the one who instilled him in him morals. The princesses, she is the one who instilled in him discipline, the way to go about in life. It is very important. Upbringing is very important. What you are is how you were raised. So to be a very good parent is very important. Many parents don't lay much stress on their children. They will send them to uh, school, they will send them to tuition, they will give them good food, they will give them whatever they want, but they don't have close dialogue with them, they don't teach them right, wrong, how to behave with others, and mostly they don't know these things. Unless some teacher brings up the issue with you about undiscipline of your child in the school. So upbringing is very important. And that is why the mother of God is mostly revered. Many people say, oh Jesus called the woman, Jesus never lay any stress on her. Because the Bible is not about her and she never wanted it to about her. It was all about 
God coming here on earth to save humankind. But there is a lot of things she does from behind and she always works from behind even now. The very way that Jesus was brought up, raised and the very way you could go out in the crowds and speak and have compassion for the crowds and do everything for the crowds is because of the way he was raised. As we know that the foster father Joseph, after some years, he is supposed to have died and he was no longer there. But he learned, Jesus learned the trade and after that mom Mary continued with him and showed him how to go about it until until at the age of 13 when he's supposed to start his ministry so brothers and sisters remember that this world is nothing but full of plasticity and duplicity nothing remains the same and no one remains the same amen amen amen, amen.